we filled out some cards and we, we just thought it upon ourselves. We thought, you know what, let's do something a little bit different. I could have got up and preached this in a way uh, that, that kind of flows the way that we're used to flowing on a Sunday morning. Uh, but today, we just, we just wanted to break it down and, and really spend a little bit of time in multiple topics rather than focusing on one topic uh, today. So I'm going to let Pastor Tommy, come on, give it up for Pastor Tommy. Yeah. Y'all love this guy? So awesome. He's the host. He's the host. Which means I can ask anything I want. Which means if I throw a curveball, I may lose my job. No, uh, you won't. I, I like curveballs. I may throw a curveball on you. Oh, I may ask that, you yeah. a question. You just yeah. better be ready. Yeah, let's back up. Let's back yeah, up. Never... <laughs> no curveballs. I do want to start with, with, with one thing, and this is kind of okay. going back to last week. I want to recap something you said. I think something you said, it, it actually was, was something I hadn't heard said in that, with that perspective or in that way, and I thought, man, that's really good, and it's good to, to, to not just, just think about our behavior yeah. Because oftentimes we get so focused on the behavior. Here's what you said. We get focused on our behavior and not our Savior. Yeah. And if we would just get more focused on our Savior than our behavior, that's when our life would be transformed. So can you just dig into that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. You better time me on this just oh, I, real quick. We're, we're going to try, to, we're gonna try to time some of these out. It's already, it's uh, already running. But it's, it's one of the things that um, there was a reel that went out this past week, and, and uh, some people liked it, and a lot of people hated it. It was great. And uh, I just want you guys to know, I'm not trying to be popular. I don't care if I have a blue check on social media. I don't know if y'all know what that means or not, but I'm not trying to be official or have a gathering or a following. I'm just trying to make Jesus popular and make him famous. And I think his scriptures do that. And I think a lot of times last week, one of the moments was, you know, you have these behavioral issues. And before too long, you start going, man, I just can't quit lying. I guess I once a liar, always a liar. Man, I just can't get over this addiction. I'm, I'm always going to be an addict. And we start focusing on our behavior rather than the person that can set us free from the behavior that we're struggling with. And that, that was one of the points. I've just tried to drive home to quit focusing on your behavior, focus on your Savior, and when you do, God cleans you up from your behavior. You can't clean yourself up. Only God can do that, uh, which ties into the vision and the mission of our church, you know, to see lives transformed through encounters with the love of Jesus. That's the vision of this church. We want to see life transformation, nothing more, nothing less. If, uh, if the church didn't grow any more, we would be okay with that. We would ask why, but we would be okay. It's not about church growth. It's not about any of that. It's about people coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The only way people's lives are really going to be changed and they come out of that behavior mindset is to really go all in with Jesus. One of the people that posted, and I, I, my team was like, you got to quit looking at what people are responding, okay? And I'm like, but I kind of like it, but then it upsets me. You know, uh, but, but one of the people, they just said, you know, you're, you're saying... Uh, now when you're saying to focus on the Savior, you're saying it's okay that you have the behavior. You focus on your Savior. So you can't overcome sin like that. And I actually commented back in the name of Compassion Church, so this was my comment. So if that was you, uh, that was actually me talking to you uh, through Compassion. But I just said, how can you focus on Jesus 100% and stay in sin? How? There is no possible way you can focus, go all in with Jesus and stay in your sin. Because when you give your life to Christ, you change. You know, and you may not change overnight like some people do. I don't get that. But some people don't change overnight. But there's this purification, sanctification process that happens, which takes us to the mission statement. You know, we exist to see lost, the lost saved, the saved freed, the freed restored, and the restored fulfilled. So lost saved or, or uh, saved, freed, restored, fulfilled. That's the four arrows in the little round button that you see. We call that a button. That's actually our discipleship process. Some people are okay with buying fire insurance. And they get saved, but they're still struggling. I'm telling you, I promise you, you do not have to struggle for the rest of your life with the things that, that keep coming up within your behavior. God can set you free. He came to set the captive Free, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 is the Old Testament, um, you know, reference to that. But, you know, that's it. So really, when you say it's a process, like, yeah, because a lot of people, when they say the prayer, and, and we, see, we see that happen here often. Yeah. Sometimes we see the same people will, will raise their hand mm -hmm. to be saved on a weekly basis, and it's almost like they think 
man, I messed up this week. I lost something. Or, and we'll get to that yeah. in a minute. But, yeah. but it's a process. It's not like once you say that prayer that everything just shifts. Yeah. Sometimes it takes time to yeah. weed some of that stuff out of our life. I think in sharing my story, my story was an immediate deliverance of things. So God delivered me from a drug addiction immediately. It was immediate. It happened that night when I gave my life to Jesus, April the 12th of the year 2000. And some people look back and say, that's your story, but that's not my story. And that, that's, that, that's not a cop-out from those people. That's true. That's my story. That's not their story. But if my God could do that for me, he can set you free. So I'm not going to dumb down the gospel because of your lack of obedience. Hello. So what I'm going to do is just keep telling you and pushing you into a relationship with Jesus because there's no way you're going to continue to go to the crack house if you have a relationship with Jesus. It ain't going to happen. There's no way you're going to keep shacking up and having sex with somebody that's not your, your wife or your husband when you are in full relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Quit focusing on your behavior. Focus on your Savior. God will clean you up. Quit trying to clean yourself up. You ain't never gonna, you're never going to do it. Never going to do it. It's that saying, you, you become who you're around. Yeah, yeah. And so show me your top five friends. I'll yeah. show you who you are. Yeah. So you, you've got to leave. Walk away. Get away from all of those friends. This is what happened to me. How, how did you clean yourself up immediately? Because I quit going around all the people that I was hanging around. But they were your best friends. If they were your best friends, you wouldn't have left them. If they were my best friends, they wouldn't have shamed me for not wanting to be around that because I'm trying to change my life. You know, so you just got to define best friend. You it's know? good. So, it's good. Uh, one, one encounter with Jesus is all you need. Yeah. One encounter. Think of the demoniac. He was crazy, naked, living in the tombs, living in a graveyard, not in his right mind. Jesus encountered him one time. Now he's fully clothed and in his right mind. Yep. One encounter with Jesus will change your whole life. Love it. Yep. Love it, love it. So that's number one. Do you like that? Yeah. Keep hanging All around right, Jesus. Let's... Number two, this, this, one, this one's good. Um, what about gossip? God bless it. <laughs> what about gossip in the church? Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember this card. It said, uh, can you speak to gossip in the church? Can you touch on gossip in the church? And um, I think this is one of the elephants because a lot of times you get caught up in groups. Some churches will call them cliques, you know, things like that. Uh, some people's like, yeah, man, y'all got a bunch of cliques at the church, you know. Well, okay, whatever. I think we got a bunch of believers that are grouping up together. It's called C groups, actually. And you could join one of those, you know, just join the clique if that's, if that's what you call it. But um, in, in that moment, people begin to, to go to other people and they gossip. There's a lot of gossip that happens in the church. And just to, to preface what I'm about to say, gossip can be true or false. Just because it's true doesn't mean you have the right to say it to somebody. If you've got something to say to someone, go to them and them alone. Don't go to everybody else. And here's what happens in the church. We mask gossip in spirituality. We become spiritual in our gossip. Hey, in the name of confidentiality, now just, between, just between me and you, now don't tell anybody else. Anytime somebody approaches me and says, just between me and you, don't tell anybody else, somebody has probably had this same conversation with them. And they've probably said, just between me and you and nobody else. So with that being said, you, you, can't, you, you have to approach it in the right way. And I think a lot of people, uh, they mask it in spirituality, uh, in the sense of confidentiality. They mask it through prayer partners. Hey, can I talk to you about so-and-so? I just really want to pray for them. No, you need to talk to them. You haven't even talked to that person that you're about to pray about. Why, why not pray with the person that you're talking about? That, that's straight up gossip. Or, you know, you got a best friend in church and y'all are just kind of talking through some of the church stuff that's happened uh, you know, and going on, stop. That is absolute gossip. And I'm going to give you a lot of references in this question, okay? So just write this down, and I want you to go back. This is, these are assignments. I'm doing the reference stuff on purpose because if you really want to know what the Bible says about it, I don't have 30, 45 minutes today to tell you everything. Go back and read it for yourself, and then study to show thyself approved, okay? Don't just take what I say. Go back and study it yourself. Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Write that down, Romans 1, 29, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. It speaks strongly against gossip. 
If you go on, I'll give you some references in a minute, but gossip is nothing but the result of a depraved mind. I wrote the definition in my Bible of depraved is morally corrupt or wicked. When someone falls into the trap of gossip, they are morally corrupt or they are wicked. It is a depraved mind. It is unfitting for Christians. You should not gossip about anybody else. You say, you got to give me some text on that. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 5, write this one down, verse 13. And then 2 Timothy, or, or actually 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, these scriptures talk about setting idle, and when people are not busy and doing the work of the Lord, now they're watching the work of the Lord and critiquing the work of the Lord. That's why compassion, we're against people that just want to come in and be complacent and sit around all the time. You shouldn't have enough time to sit and look at everybody else and wonder why, why is she on the prayer team and why are you not? Why are you not on the prayer team? Well, I didn't like how they did that. Well, can you help us make that a little bit better? Instead of being complacent and complaining and doing all that, I heard a guy say one time, Pastor Tommy said, if you complain, you remain. <laughs> but if you praise, he'll raise. You know, if you complain, if you just do that, you set back, you're setting idle. And it talks about, I mean, it talks about busy bodies. And then honestly, work the scripture. Work to Scripture. Here's another reference. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. The Bible says, if you got alt with someone, to go to him and him alone. I don't know what just happened to my microphone, but something did. Go to him and him alone. Don't go to anybody else. Well, they're not going to listen to me. Well, follow the Bible. At that point, take somebody else with you and go to that person. Well, they didn't listen to me. Then the Bible says, take it before the leadership of the church or take it before the church. That does not mean that you're going to get a two-minute session on the stage to tell everybody about the junk in someone else's life. You wouldn't want that to happen to you. What that actually means in context in Matthew 18 is to take it to the leadership of the church. Let the leadership deal with that. If the leadership deals with that, here's what the Bible says. If they do not listen after you went to them, Someone else went with you and went to them and talked about this, the issue that you have. Then you took it to the leadership of the church. The leadership went to them. The Bible says have nothing to do with them. But here's what we do. We hear something, then we jump to a conclusion. We don't want anything to do with someone, and now we're talking bad behind their back. You're in such a worse spot than they are at that point. So just stop all the gossip. I think, I think the church could be unified. The church could really see some great things happen if we stop all of this gossip stuff. Yeah, Quit good. backbiting and talking about each other. Man, that's your brother. That's your sister. Well, they, they don't live life the way that I do. Who cares? You may not live life right. I mean, come on. Let's just let's get along. Good stuff. Can we just get along? I thought you was going to stand up for a minute. I was fixing to, was, honestly. I, I, Ed, if I stand up, he's done. Oh, it's, that's it. Clock's out. Out. What, what about, hang on, this is one I didn't tag on to that at the end. What about your spouse? What do you mean? <laughs> I mean, I Can't just corre I correct, I correct Jill all the time that's for what, gossiping okay. in the church. So I'm good with correcting Amy. That's is that what, what you're I've been doing. About? Yeah, I want to make sure I'm good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. She gets mad, it's okay, We're right? We're kidding. We're shit. <laughs> she said, <laughs> like, we'll see what you, never mind. <laughs> I was going to go said, somewhere, talk about but I should when we get home. Right? <laughs> yeah. Number three. Well, here's some gossip. Yeah. yeah. Never mind. Is all sin under grace? Two-part question. Is all sin under grace backed up by, does the Bible say because of grace that I can sin as much as I want to? Mm -mm -mm. Interesting. Hallelujah. So um, I like Tommy. Tommy's blacked out the names, you know, of, of the people that have, have wrote these questions. So you may be in this, in this room. So here's what I'll say. Two-part question. Is all sin under grace? Um, according to my scriptures, the scriptures that I read, there's only one sin that is unforgivable, and it's the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. It's when you totally reject God and you speak against God and the Spirit of God. So is all sin under grace? I, I think all confessed sin falls under the grace of God. If you confess your sin, uh, the Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which means unconfessed sin is unrighteousness. 
Confess sins brings righteousness back into your life, which the word righteousness means right living or right standing with God. So when you have sin in your life, you are not in right standing with God. And according to the scriptures last week that we went through, through, when you're unrighteous, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I don't care. It doesn't say all churchgoers will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It says the unrighteous. You can be in church, in the flow of church, doing all of your church things and still be unrighteous. But is, is all sin under the grace? All confessed sin comes under the grace of God, of course. So the second part of that is, does the Bible say that because of grace, I can sin as much as I want to? Now, I'm not saying about this specific individual, but let's address this question. I think most people that are asking that question is wanting to justify their flesh, and the sin that they have in their life. That's why we ask questions like that. You know, does the Bible actually say that? Actually, the Bible speaks totally against that question. And let me, let me prove it to you. Romans chapter, I stood up. Romans oh. chapter 6. Here we go. Y'all better follow me on that camera. Here we go. Romans chapter 6. What shall uh, we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul's addressing this. Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Here's what that actually means. Does it actually mean that the more I sin, the more grace comes over my life? So the grace is abounding my life and it doesn't matter what I do? So this, this was a question or some topics or something that, that Paul was addressing in the church in Rome. But Paul asked a question back to the people in the church of Rome. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Two questions. Go to the next one. Verse 2, certainly not. No, don't abuse grace. We live in a society that's like, hey, man, it doesn't matter what you do, man. As long as you've confessed Christ over your life, you just go out and do whatever you want to do. Where is that in the Bible? I have been, I've read my Bible, and I'm not bragging, but I have read my Bible front to back, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 times. I know what the Bible says. I don't know if I clearly understand everything that the Bible says, but I've never seen that. And here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So if you continue to live in sin with no conviction at all, you didn't die to sin. You just went through the motions. Am I making any sense? But this same guy, here's what this same guy understood, and he taught us this in Romans chapter 7. If you go and you read Paul's letters, here's what he said in Romans 7. He said, the things I wish to do, those things I don't do. In other words, there's things, there's righteous things in my life that I, I want to do, but I can't find myself to do it. And there's things that I shouldn't be doing. And I find myself doing the very things that I shouldn't be doing. And he begins to talk about this war, this struggle that's happening on the inside of us called our sinful nature. And he recognizes that there's a sinful nature on the inside of us, but he also plays it back knowing that there's a spirit man on the inside of us that's greater than the sinful nature that's in us. So if you just continue to go all in with Christ, can you overcome sin? Yes. Grace is not there as a license to sin. Grace is there to help you overcome your sin. Amen. So you say, and, and, and we'll get to this, I think, in the next question or the other, but a lot of people, you think you have to get saved every week. You don't have to get saved every week. Here's when you know you need to get your relationship right with Jesus. If you are in blunt sin, I mean blatant sin, you are practicing something that the Bible clearly says is sin and you have no conviction of it, you need to repent. You need to repent. That means to turn away from. And the Bible uses two uh, different words when it comes to confessing or repenting. That's the two words. Repent, to turn away from. Confess. Okay, so if we confess our sins... So there's a confession after the repentance. Why? Because we find ourselves, because of the sinful nature, falling into the very same things that we've been set free from. So what should we do? We've already repented, but we've slipped up, and now the conviction's there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You make a mistake, and your heart starts beating 50,000 miles a minute, and you know, and tears begin to swell up in your eyes. If that is you, you're saved. There is conviction on the inside of you. Now what you have to do is you've got to confess that sin so that God can forgive you of that sin and cleanse you from that unrighteousness because you've brought, you've, you've stepped out 
of that right living with God for a moment and God's saying, just confess that sin. It's under grace. So unconfessed sin is not under grace. I'm just telling you right now, show me in the Bible where it is, where unconfessed sin is under the grace of God. We abuse the grace of God, and I think it's crazy, right? And here's what the Scripture says. Can I keep going? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're good. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Look at what it says. Do not be deceived. We've seen that same word, deception. We've seen that same word in gossip. Don't be deceived. If there's anything the enemy is trying to do to the church today, he's trying to deceive us. And we'll see it here in another question through false teaching. And people say, oh, it's okay. It's fine. Don't worry about it. God's grace is sufficient for thee. My goodness gracious, do not be deceived. Why? Because God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If you sow, you're going to reap. Look at verse 8 just real quick. For he who sows to his flesh... Well, of the flesh reap corruption. But, somebody say but. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So how am I going to reap everlasting life? I'm going to reap everlasting life by sowing into the Spirit, not the flesh. Quit using God's grace as an excuse to continue to sin. God knows your heart. You can't trick him. Don't be deceived. He's not mocked. That makes sense? It's good. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah. Woo woo. All right. <laughs> he stood up and just went, didn't he? Yeah. Just went. Yeah. So yeah. that leads us really to number four. Woo, this you, is you a good one. Yeah. So go ahead and stand back up because it's, it's, it's coming. It's coming. Help him, Jesus. Can you lose your salvation? It's a good question. I think, I think it's the wrong question. Honestly, I, I, think, I think, again, a lot of people, they're trying to figure out, is God going to take something away from me? If I mess up, is God going to take something away from me? And I will tell you today, uh, God's not in the business of taking stuff away from you. Hey, let me, let me see uh, Jill real quick. Hey, Jill, hand me that pencil. Hand me that pencil right there. Yeah, beep, 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 beep. Here's what a lot of people think. This is God, and this is the book of life. Oh, 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 crazy done went crazy. Take his name out of the Lamb's book of life. Oh, he just repented. He repented. He repented. Write it back down. I mean, I don't know what my sheet of paper looks like in heaven, but I'll go ahead and tell you, there is a, there, there's, there's an eraser hole in the sheet of paper. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's, he's the, we got, we got to know something, guys. But listen, here's what I would say. Any of you follow me on camera. Here we go. Any of you ever lose your keys? Anybody ever lost the keys to the car? Raise your hand if you lost the keys to your car. What happens when you lose the keys to your car? Can you go start your car? Why can't you start the car? I mean, you bought the car. You own the car. The car's got an engine. It's got a transmission. It's got everything in it, but you've lost your keys. And I think sometimes we think that we lose something. You, I don't know if you lose the verbiage. I hate that verbiage. I don't think you lose your salvation, but I surely believe that you can walk away from it. I do think you can. Actually, I'm, I'm going to prove it to you in Scriptures. You can walk away from your salvation. But I said a prayer. Okay. I, I get that you said a prayer, but you are not living for Jesus anymore. Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life. Without holiness, the Bible says, you will not see the Lord. You can't live an unholy, unrighteous life. I don't care what prayer you've prayed and then go back and say, Oh, Jesus, Jesus, oh, thank God for the pearly gates. Hallelujah. <laughs> so here's what I got to do. If I've lost my keys, here's what I got to figure out. Where did I leave my keys? I come up. I come over here, oh, here's my keys. And you go back to the place that you laid them down. Amen. You find your way back to God. God didn't leave you, nor will he leave you, because he says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But never in the scripture does it say that you'll never leave him nor forsake him. And let's understand this. Number one, we got to understand this. We are not God. 
So let's go back to gossip. When you're looking at everybody in the church and you're saying, well, yeah, I don't know if they're saved or not. I'm just trying to love people to Jesus because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. I'm trying to lead people back to the cross. I'm not trying to judge them. They're going to stand, you, all of us, are going to stand before God one day and give an account for our life, not man. So if man told you something that was not true and you stand in front of God, that's on you, not him. And if you believe they lie, because I don't know if you know this, this is where we're fixing to go, but I don't know if you know this, but there's false teachers, there's false doctrine, the Bible clearly talks about it. Second, Second Peter, you guys can go ahead and pull that scripture up if you don't mind. But I believe it's in, yeah, it's in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. But to give you some context, Peter's addressing this whole situation. There's false doctrine that's being done. There's false teaching that is happening. And there's good believing people that have now fallen underneath the leadership of false teaching, false prophets, false doctrine. They know the righteousness of God. They do that. And here's what the scripture says about this. And this is not taking things out of context. Go back and read it for yourself. 2 Peter 2.24, if after they, it's not talking about the false teachers. It's not talking about any of that. It's talking about the people under the leadership of false teaching. Okay? For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through what? It's my time, ain't it? Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So these people have escaped the pollutions of the world. They've come out of the world. Through what? Through Jesus Christ. Through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Here's what happens. They are again entangled in them in what? In the pollutions of the world. And overcome. Which this scripture begins to paint a picture that there are times, if you allow it to happen, where you can get entangled again with the pollutions of the world. And those pollutions, if you don't watch it, will overcome you. And the Bible says the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Verse 21. For it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness, to not known the truth. So now they've known the truth. Now they're rebelling against the truth or they've been deceived. There's that deception again. They've been deceived and now they're going against the truth. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. I think there's a 22 on there if I'm not mistaken. But it has happened to them, those people who were believers, those people who were following Jesus Christ through the knowledge of Jesus it's happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed, which is a pig, to her wallowing in the mire. And when people begin to tell you that you can't fall away from God, God didn't push you away. You walked away. The scriptures say, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you, saith the Lord. Who moved first? We did. So if we can draw nigh to God, we can drift away from God. That's why a close personal relationship is so important with Jesus Christ. Go to your Bible in the book of James, James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, I believe it is. Brethren, why are scriptures like this in the, in the Bible if, if you can't walk away from God after you've got, given your life to him? If anyone among you, James is talking to believers. He's not talking about, hey, if any unbeliever among you wanders from the truth, they don't even know the truth. Unbelievers don't know the truth. They, they haven't accepted the truth yet. But the Bible says if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, oh, hold on a minute. So now I, I, I'm, I'm being turned back in the right direction, right? Look at what it says in verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner. Why, the, why would I even say a sinner? Uh -uh. Um, of course, saved by grace through faith, but grace covers me. It doesn't matter. I no longer have sin in my life because of Jesus' blood. Quit abusing the power of Christ. Stop to, to meet your own personal needs. But that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Those, those are things. So if you ask me 
Uh, can we lose our salvation? I don't like the verbiage, but I will tell you that you can walk away from the salvation that God has given you, but that was your decision, not his. He will never leave you nor forsake you. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter eight, come on now. Nothing, not one thing. You walking away doesn't separate you from the love of God, which means there's always a way back which is why 1 John 1, 9 comes into play. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He's always faithful, he's always just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, amen? If you're taking notes, write down Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. Also write down uh, Romans chapter 11, verses 19 through 23. So just write some of that stuff down, go back, read it, study it, believe it, do all that stuff. Let's go to the next. Good stuff. One question left. Okay. Last question. You ready for it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know which one you're going to pick because we have yeah. two left and we're out of time. But. Yeah. So what does the Bible say about divorce? Mm. So somebody said, holy. <laughs> holy what? So, hey, can we just get a piano out here? Just the piano player because we're going to have to make this one uh, pretty spiritual. Um, so what does the Bible say about divorce? Uh, I, I believe in our culture. Let's talk about culture just real quick because divorce is running rapid. I don't know if you know the divorce rate in the church versus the divorce rate in the world. Do y'all know that? I think the divorce rate right now, the last statistic through Barna that I heard, uh, which is a research, uh, research group, 51% of marriages end in divorce in the world, non-Christians. But Christians are a little bit different. In the church, 51% of people, marriages end in divorce. Our statistic inside the church is no different than outside of the church. Believers are no different than unbelievers. So I think we have an issue here, and I think it's a cultural issue. It's, it's nothing, I think it's what we're brought up in. It's, it's what we're taught. It's, it's what we learn. It's, it's what we see, you know. I believe my dad, uh, his, his wife just passed away, several months ago, but I believe that that was my dad's eighth wife. Uh, my, my wife's mom has been married seven times, is that right? And not married right now. I think it's the culture that we live in. It's almost test driving a car, and I'm not talking bad about my dad. He may be watching. Love you, pops. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we're like, well, this is just not working. And so since it's not working, it's so easy. I mean, you can file for a divorce for $99. Let's just get a divorce. So, Divorce becomes, uh, or, or marriage, let's say marriage becomes a contract, not a covenant. And I think in biblical days, you see a covenant and God took it really, really serious. Because if you look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, it says that God hates divorce. You say, well, that's Old Testament, not New Testament. Wait till you see what Jesus said. But Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God hates divorce. And then in chapter 3 of Malachi, verse 6, he says this. He says, I am the Lord and I change not. God's not changing. When the Old Testament transitioned into the New Testament, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, nothing, they didn't change. Their character and who they were, God wasn't walking through a city and they go, hey, who is that God? He goes, oh, I've changed. There's a New Testament. He's the same God. He changes not. So now what we got to do is we got to go back to Scripture and see what Jesus says about it, which is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32. Furthermore, it has been said, he quotes an Old Testament text. He says, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And in the Levitical law, Moses was allowed for people by God. God approved it in the sense of he approved the hardness of a heart. He knew because of the hardness of a heart, go back and read the text, but because of the hardness of a heart, a man could write a certificate of divorce to his wife. Okay? Old Testament. Jesus just quotes it. This is the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount. This is Jesus's, if, if Jamie Grisham had a popular sermon, this was Jesus's sermon on YouTube that everybody goes back and watches. Because the, the, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, some of the most important things that Jesus ever said while he walked the earth, he said, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He's saying this in there. And he says this, but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now listen, I'm not looking for the church to be half empty next week. Nobody's condemning you. 
You may be getting this knowledge and really realizing some of this stuff for the very first time today. If you really want to dive deep in to what Jesus said about marriage, same book, Matthew, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, and he begins to lay out what marriage should look like. Go back and read Matthew 19, 1 through 10. But I have to always lead you. Jesus just said what, what, I, what I read. Jesus said that. So Jesus states that in, unless there is sexual immorality, then that person does not have the right to get a divorce. But I can't stand him. Well, if you would have known him a little bit more and y'all would have courted a little bit before y'all got married, you may have known him a little bit more. Or maybe you don't know him because you're not spending time with him enough or he's not spending enough time. There's counseling, there's therapy, there's all of that stuff. Now, I understand because of the world that we live in, the, this, this is unpopular teaching, but we have to teach this because it's what Jesus said, right? Another out, and I'm calling it an out in parentheses in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which is an amazing marriage uh, chapter. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15 and 16, it actually talks about the unbelieving spouse. And it says that if you're living with an unbelieving spouse and they leave you and walk away, then you have a right to get a divorce. So let them depart if they want to. Pastor Tommy, I know that I'm out of time, and we talked a little bit about this the last uh, service, but I, I want to address it yeah, with the whole, you know, some people come up, and every time we talk about marriage from the stage, people goes, yeah, but what about an abusive husband or even an abusive wife, whether that's verbally or physically? And I'll tell you, man, um, I, don't, I think that that could fall into something because I don't know if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you wouldn't be abusing your wife physically or uh, you know, verbally. I, I just don't see how you can be a, a believer in Jesus and actually do that. But I will tell you, if you're in an abusive relationship, separate, get out of it, talk to someone about it, do something about it. Don't, you are never anyone's doormat. Okay, the Bible never calls us to be doormats. So there's this thing called separation and see if you can figure that out. And then whatever has to happen in that moment, you've got to lay that before God. And then lastly, maybe you're here and you go, man, I fit that category in Matthew where Jesus talked about that in chapter 5. And now I feel bad because now I feel like an adulterer, an adulteress. And now I see what God's word says. Well, you know what? If you feel like that you're out of line, don't be condemned. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, he said, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't you allow the enemy to condemn you. If you feel that on the inside of you, fall before God and say, God, I'm so sorry. And God, I know I'm on my third marriage and I, I wasn't even living for you back then. But right now in this marriage, this is my marriage. This is our marriage. This is our uh, gift to you, Jesus. We're giving you this marriage. We want you to help us in this marriage and be the best wife that you could ever be or best husband that you could ever be right now in this marriage. It doesn't really matter what happens in the past. Ask for forgiveness of all of that stuff. But from this day on, if you know what the Word of God says, just listen to the Word of God obey it as much as you can and allow God to move in your life. Amen. Is that okay? Is, is that cool? All right. If you would, just let me pray with you for a moment. And I'm going to get off, uh, off the stage. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're in the room and you're like, man, something that you guys talked about, it really hits me hard because I've been gossiping or man, I'm just at the moment where I don't know if I have this relationship with Jesus because I feel like if I tell a little white lie that Jesus don't love me anymore. No, Jesus loves you. Right in the midst of all your mess, Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that He died on a cross for you. He saved your soul. Maybe you need to get some things right, but don't let the enemy condemn you because you're not 100% right with God right now. Just confess your sins to Him. Some of you, you need to repent of your sins. You need to turn from that life that you're living. Some of you, you've turned from that old life, but now you're pointing in a direction you find yourself slipping up and falling. Just confess those sins. And He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If that's you today, you fit in one of those categories, I just want to pray with you. Just raise your hand. If you're online right now, we just want, there's several people in the room, they're raising their hand today. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I don't have it all figured out. But what I do know is I'm not in right standing with you. 
and I confess my sins today to you. I repent. I turn from my old life. I point myself into a spiritual direction that you want me to go. The paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Help me walk this walk and talk this talk. Thank you for saving my soul and for being my Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, amen, give God a big hand clap today. God's good, isn't He?